became king, married to wicked Jezebel, they set up Baal worship throughout the northern kingdom. This sets the stage for what occurs in 1 Kings chapter 18. When Elijah comes to Ahab, and he comes before the he tells Ahab, gather all of the people of Israel together and bring the prophets of Baal. There were 450 of these prophets of Baal. And so they come together at a place in the northern part of Israel called Mount Carmel. Now, Mount Carmel isn't a tall mountain. It's more like a ridge that uh, is not too far from the Mediterranean Sea. It is a very fertile, green, lush ridge that rises from the plains that are in the, the, sea, the seashore and uh, before you get over into the valley of Megiddo and that area. It's a very beautiful place. I've had the opportunity to go there. And there on Mount Carmel, Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest. And he says to the people of Israel, now you judge. He says to the people of Israel, you judge. It's time for Israel to make up its mind. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve Yahweh, Jehovah, God, or are you going to serve Baal? See, they had been serving Baal in the name of God. And, and Elijah says, you've got to make up your mind. You've got to make a choice. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve Yahweh? Are you going to serve Baal? One or the other. You can't have it both ways. And he proposed a contest. He said, here's what we'll do. The prophets of Baal will build their altar. They'll take an ox, they'll quarter it, they'll put it on the altar. They'll call upon their god Baal to send down fire from heaven, consume the sacrifice. And I'll do the same. Whichever God answers, this will be God. Well, the people were agreeable to that. So, the prophets of Baal, I love this story. The prophets of Baal build their altar, they take an ox, they slaughter it, they put it on the they put the wood on the altar. They put the, the sacrifice on the wood. And then they begin crying out to Baal. Baal, come down and consume the sacrifice. Guess what happens? Nothing. So they cry out louder. Baal, come down and consume the sacrifice. And they begin dancing around the altar and they begin making all kinds of gyrations and, and wild attempts to gain Baal's attention. And Elijah's standing over to the side and you can just see him smirking. And then Elijah says, Hmm, what's wrong? Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's taken a journey. Maybe, maybe he's indisposed. The prophets of Baal are religious. For hours, not just for... This was something that went on all afternoon. They began taking stones and spears and lances and actually mutilating themselves, cutting themselves, allowing their blood to flow down their bodies onto the ground in an attempt to somehow stir up Baal. By the way, I hadn't mentioned it hadn't rained in three and a half years. Do you know that? Because of the people's idolatry, Elijah back in 1 Kings 17, 1 had said, it's not going to rain until God says so. <laughs> Finally, Elijah says, okay, let me add it. He takes 12 stones, he builds an altar, he places wood upon the altar, he places the sacrifice, he quarters the sacrifice, puts it up on the, up on the altar, and then he does something really strange if you're trying to start a fire. He calls for four big pitchers of water. 
and says, pour it on the pour it on the sacrifice and on the wood and on the altar. So they pour these four big pitchers of water on there, and Elijah then says, go do it again. So they go get four more. They bring them, they pour them up on the, uh, up on the altar, so much so that it runs over the altar, and there's a trench that's built around the altar, and it fills up, the water fills the trench. And Elijah cries out to God to consume this sacrifice. And I'm telling you the words that no sinner came out of Elijah's mouth. Then fire bolted out of heaven, consumed the sacrifice, the wood, and licked up the water out of the trenches. And Elijah called the people of Israel to seize the prophets of Baal. 450 of them, they killed them at the brook called Kishon. And there was a great, great victory in Elijah's life. Don't you love it when you have a victory? Don't you love it when something really spectacular and good has happened to you and, uh, and, and you, you are walking on cloud nine? When you've aced an exam, when you've gotten the letter from the dean telling you're on the dean's list, when you... Uh, uh, you know, when you, you get the promotion at work, when you get the raise, don't you just love it? Watch out. Watch out. The second scene in Elijah's life is the threat. I'm over in chapter 19 now. In verse 1, wicked, sinister Jezebel, when she hears from her husband Ahab about what has happened to the prophets of Baal, remember she is a leader in the worship of Baal in Israel, she said, may the gods do so to me, and even more so, if by this time tomorrow you are not like one of them. You know what you call that? A threat. That was a threat. She says, Elijah, by this time tomorrow, you, you're going to be among those prophets that were killed. You, you are going to be a dead man because of what you have done. Do you ever have threats in your life? Not every threat is like the one that was posed to Elijah. But all of us sometimes feel threatened by the cares of the world, I think. Sometimes we feel threatened when our job may be insecure. Sometimes we may feel threatened when our health has taken a turn for the worse. Sometimes we may feel threatened when someone is angry with us or someone is ridiculing us. Numerous threats come against us in life. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that. Over in um, 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy, and he said, All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Persecution is a real thing for the Christian. It may be mental, it may be verbal, it may well be physical. But all of us experience threats in life. And sometimes those threats come when we least expect them. Follow, following, on a, following a high water mark like Elijah's victory over these prophets, when everything seemed to be going well, suddenly there is this message from Jezebel, Elijah, you're going to be a dead man if I get hold of you. And sometimes that happens in our lives as well. So the threat, the threat, and that leads then to the third scene, and that is the escape. What do you do when you're threatened? Do you, is it fight or flight? Well, Elijah chose 
flight. Look at what happens. All of this happens up in Israel, in the northern kingdom. Elijah flees, and he goes all the way down to Beersheba. You know where Beersheba is? It is in the southern kingdom of Judah. I mean, that is like going from Mountain Home to El Dorado. That's that going from the north to the south. Getting a, about as far away as he could get. He, he fled. He escaped. He said, I'm getting out of here. And that's what a lot of people try to do, I think, when they are faced with a threat. They're like, what, what, what do I need to do to get away from this? What do I need to do to alleviate this suffering? We're not much for suffering. Have you noticed that? Yeah, anybody notice that? We don't have classes in how to suffer. We have a lot of classes in how to avoid suffering. Well, Elijah didn't want to suffer. That was his humanity. Let's get away. Let's escape. The fourth scene, and one that I'll spend a lot more time with, is despair. He goes to Beersheba, and here Elijah makes a very crucial decision. He leaves his servant, who is with him, and he goes a day's journey further by himself into the wilderness, the Judean wilderness. Now, if you've ever traveled in uh, that part of the world, around the Dead Sea, and I know Dutch has been there going back in May. Some others have been there. But let me tell you, folks, that is barren. It, when it talks about wilderness, it's not talking about the frontier wilderness of America that was full of trees and wildlife and all of those things. I mean, this is barren desert. I remember on the, the trip to Israel that I was on back uh, uh, about 20 years or so ago now, but I remember so well, we got up and left the Dead Sea where we had stayed overnight. And as we were headed south, all the way down to the very southernmost city in Israel today, the city of Elat on the Red Sea, we were traveling down through what is known as the Great Rift. Uh, and there's nothing, there are no trees, there's no green. Some scholars speculate that that barren area south of the Dead Sea, which looked like it's just nothing but but volcanic ash almost. Some have speculated that may have been the site of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it's just desolate. And Elijah has traveled all the way to Beersheba, and lo and behold, he goes, he goes a little bit further, but he does find a juniper tree, a broom tree, and a little bit of shade. And he sits there by himself. Here was where Elijah made his mistake. And here's where a lot of people make mistakes. Listen to me. One of the worst things you can do when discouragement befalls you is to shut other people out. And yet that's what we so often do. So often when we have become discouraged, we want to retreat inside ourselves. We're like the turtle that pulls its head into its shell. We go into our room and we pull the shades. We don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want to hear from anybody. And folks, that is prime breeding ground for a major pity party. Oh, woe is me. Nobody cares for me. Nobody loves me. Nobody is interested in me. Oh, 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 oh. Anybody ever been there? And that's where Elijah was. He had left his servant, gone off all by himself. He sits down, he's totally exhausted, and he has. I'm the only, I, I'm it. Woe is me. Woe is me. 
despair. We're told about depression, and I realize there is clinical depression that is very real and very prevalent. But oftentimes, one of the things that breeds depression in people's life is this despair that follows a period of, of uncertainty or a threat of some type. And if left unchecked, that despair can blossom into a depression that will last for weeks or months or even longer. But we need to understand something about this. We need to understand the process and the cure. Well, Elijah is out there under a juniper tree, and now there is, and this is the fifth scene, I call it, touched by an angel. Elijah's fallen asleep. He's exhausted. He's just exhausted. Mentally, physically, spiritually. You ever been there? Just exhausted. And while he's asleep, someone touches him. Wake up, Elijah. Rise and eat. Elijah's eyes pop open and there's an angel. And the angel has prepared fresh baked bread, a bread cake on hot stones, and has a pitcher of water. Arise, Elijah, and eat. See, that's what Elijah needed. He needed nourishment. So he rose up, he ate the bread, he drank, and then guess what he did again? Went back to sleep. That happens twice. And I think that is indicative to us of what happens so often when we get discouraged. Sometimes the reason we get discouraged is because we are exhausted. We may be exhausted physically. In our, in our country, unlike many countries in the world, we've got this crazy, crazy notion that your self-worth is determined by work, 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 produce, 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 produce. And, and nuts with everything else. And we've got people in our society who are so stressed out, they are prime targets for a crash emotionally because they don't ever rest. And there are some of you that are probably that way. You just don't ever take time off. And I, by the way, when I'm talking about time off, I'm talking about real time off. I'm not talking about taking a vacation to Disney World. Because those of you who've done that know that it's probably more stressful than staying home working. Am I right? I mean, we need down time. Jesus needed that. Look at Mark 135. He went out early in the morning to a lonely place to pray. Jesus needed it. Luke talks, I believe it's in Luke 9, about how he often went into the mountains to pray, to get by himself. Jesus was replenishing himself in the Father's presence, and we need that. There are four times when we are most susceptible to discouragement. You might want to write these down. Four times when we're most susceptible to discouragement. And they form the word halt, H-A-L-T, okay? The first time is when we're hurt, when somebody has said or done something that has hurt our feelings or maybe has even hurt us physically. The second time is when we're angry, when we're angry over a situation, circumstance. The third time is when we are lonely, And the fourth time is when we're tired, when we're worn out. Those four conditions often bring about discouragement. They did in Elijah's life. Look at that. He had been threatened. He was hurt. Maybe he was angry. He certainly was lonely. And he was definitely tired. All of those things. 
Now, after the angel, there comes the sixth scene, and that is the voice. I'd love that. I may make a TV show called The Voice. Um, love that term. <laughs> Elijah, after he has slept, he rises again, and there's more to eat. The angel feeds him, and it's enough sustenance for Elijah to go for 40 days and 40 nights. What does he do? He leaves the wilderness of Ju Judah, and he goes all the way to Mount Horeb. What was Mount Horeb? The mountain of God, sometimes called Sinai. He goes all the way. That's quite a journey. Quite a journey. Why did he go there? Elijah, here's what I think. Elijah wanted to talk to God. He wanted to have a face-to-face sit-down with God. And he wanted to know some answers. He was discouraged. And he wanted to know, God, why has all of this happened to me? So where do you go to talk to God? You go where God has talked. Or uh, the mountain of God. And so he goes there and he finds a cave that he can uh, dwell in. And while he is there, suddenly there is the voice that says, what are you doing, Elijah? And Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord my God, but the people of Israel have forsaken him. They've broken, they've, they've broken down his altars. They've all forsaken him, and I, I alone am left. The voice tells Elijah to wait for the voice of God to move to move to the place where God may speak to him. So Elijah moves to the front of the cave and uh, suddenly there's this wind, this wind that is so strong it shakes the mountain and it even breaks the rock. That's a strong wind that's breaking rock. But God wasn't in that wind. There was an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And there was a raging fire, but God wasn't in the fire. And then there was a gentle breeze. Elijah covered himself with his cape, his mantle. What are you doing here, Elijah? The same question the second time. I've been very zealous. For God, everyone else has forsaken him. I'm the only one that's left. Have you ever noticed how we, uh, we look for God in the spectacular things? We want God to announce his intentions for us with neon lights, flashing strobes, sounds and peals of thunder. Resounding trumpets. Dun, da, da, da. This is my will for your life. None of that. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. Here's what I want you to do. Go back to Damascus. Anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Go to Israel and anoint Jehu over Israel. And anoint Elisha as your own successor. And Elisha, Elijah, by the way, I have still got seven thousand men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Now go. Victory. The scene of victory. Elijah's story begins with victory at Mount Carmel and ends with victory 
over Ahab and Jezebel. Let me give you real quick, just real, real quick, five things to do if you're discouraged. Number one, remember that God really does love you. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're in you every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations chapter 3. Number two, be transparent. Be transparent enough to ask for help. If you're discouraged, be transparent enough to, to say, I'm struggling, I need some help, I need some encouragement. Don't feel like you've got to do it all by yourself. Number three, remember, it's not all about you. If you are facing discouragement in your life, the worst thing you can do is retreat to yourself. The best thing you can do is to get out and serve somebody else. Number four, look to Jesus. The Bible says he's tempted in all points as we are, yet was without sin. Don't you know he was tempted to become discouraged? And yet he remained faithful to his Father's will. And number five, accept your limitations. There are some things you cannot do, but there are things you can do. Don't focus on what you cannot do. If you're an older person and you can't do some things you could do, so what? There are still things you can do. Bloom where you are planted. Tonight, if you're in need of encouragement, prayers, if you just want somebody to love on you for a little while, we hope you'll come. If you're not a Christian, put Christ on tonight in baptism while we stand and sing.